Welcome to this special episode of Tech News Briefing for Monday, April 10th. I'm Zoe Thomas for The Wall Street Journal. This is the second episode of our series, Artificially Minded, where we look at how artificial intelligence is changing our lives, livelihood, and culture. The first episode, AI 101, aired last week. If you haven't heard that yet, go check it out. It's a great primer on how AI works and why this moment is different. But there are so many questions about the way new generative AI technologies could affect us. So today, we're taking a little time to answer your questions. Thank you to everyone who sent something in. With me to answer them is WSJ tech reporter Karen Howe. Hi, Karen. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having me, Zoe. So we got quite a lot of great questions, but before we dive into them, you've been covering AI developments for a while. I want to know what you're watching closely. I'm really excited that so many people are finally starting to really pay attention to AI development and starting to participate and kind of ask questions around where this technology comes from, who's developing it, because this technology is so influential that it really does require the participation of so many people. So I'm that's really what I'm watching. I'm watching how people are coming online, scrutinizing this thing and making AI development more a part of the thing that they care about. All right, let's get into some of the listener questions. Here's the first one. Hello, my name is Ralph Franco from San Antonio, Texas. My question is, to what extent uh, is generative AI producing you know, sort of crazy results. You ask a question and you get an answer that doesn't make any sense or you get an answer to a question that doesn't make any sense. So I think here what Ralph is talking about are AI hallucinations. Can you tell us what those are and why they occur? So the thing about how generative AI works, I think there's a common misconception that when you're chatting with ChatGPT, it's sort of scanning the internet for information and then synthesizing it for you. That's not exactly how it works. It's actually trying to construct sentences that sound reasonable based on the probability of certain words and phrases being frequently used together. So it's not actually identifying specific pieces of information. It's literally just kind of a really powerful autocomplete where it takes words and then assembles them based on the frequency in which it sees it within the internet text. It's difficult to quantify how often that produces something like a hallucination, but a really good rule of thumb is to think about when you're asking about something, what do you think would be the quality of the data that ChatGPT or the AI tool was trained on? If you're asking about something that is like really common knowledge, then it's very likely you'll get correct information because it is just said so often on the internet. But if you start asking about something really niche or really fringe or areas that are actually known to have really high levels of misinformation on the internet, that's when you are going to start getting garbage reflected in these answers. And this is also really relevant depending on the language that you ask these tools uh, your questions in. If you're speaking in English and a lot of the English language data on the internet is more high quality, then you'll get more high quality answers. But if you're speaking in a different language, especially minority languages that are not as commonly used on the internet, then the quality of the answers will rapidly decline. Okay, this question comes from Ayala Stone, who is a high school math teacher in Maryland. My question is, is it possible to know for sure that a student is plagiarizing ChatGPT? That's such a good question. Not really. (laughs) I mean, hopefully at this moment in time, if you've known a student for long enough as a teacher, you would start to recognize if there are things that are off about, you know, they might be performing at a different level than they usually do, or they're using language they usually don't. But to be honest, as ChatGPT becomes more and more common and you start having students in your class that start in your class with using ChatGPT, it'll be really hard for teachers to figure out where that information is coming from. I mean, this is certainly a question that we've heard from a lot of teachers, professors, even parents. Are there any tools out there at the moment to help people figure out when ChatGPT is being copied or used for homework assignments? There are definitely tools where you can do a quick check to see if text has been generated by AI. 
The issue is that the tools aren't accurate and they're really easy to game because they're looking for the exact output of ChatGPT or whatever other AI generated tool. And it's quite easy for a student to just edit things a little bit to suddenly fool the detection system. Okay, this next question is a big one, and I think a lot of people will be curious about this. Hello, my name is Raphael Almanzar. I live in Salisbury, North Carolina. What I'm wondering is, are researchers actively trying to prevent a singularity where AI becomes as intelligent or more intelligent than human beings? Yeah, that's a really great question that is definitely on a lot of people's minds. I think there's sort of two questions, actually, that are being asked here. One is, are researchers trying to prevent AI from becoming more intelligent than human beings? And then the other one is, are they then trying to prevent the singularity, which is the moment in which technology becomes so powerful that it becomes uncontrollable by humans? The first part of that question is that OpenAI is actively trying to create AI that is smarter than human beings. That is their stated mission. They said that their mission is to create artificial general intelligence or AGI, which is broadly defined as AI that can outdo humans in a wide variety of tasks. But there are a lot of efforts within the AI research community to try to do this in a safe way. I think there's a wide range, though, of how people define what safe means. So OpenAI is working on things like alignment, which is about trying to create these systems that are smarter than humans, but will also follow our values and continue to work together with us collaboratively. Um, But there's movements like the slow AI movement that's about building this technology slower so that we can be more thoughtful at every step of the process for how to build in guardrails, whether that's policy guardrails or technical guardrails. There's also approaches like participatory AI, which is about involving more of the community in building AI so that the community themselves can actually say what they want out of these technologies and design for technology solutions that are relevant to the problems that they face. Karen, we've seen a lot of different uses for AI so far, but now we've got a question on what role it might play next. Hey, this is Freddie Moda from Chicago. And I'm actually wondering about AI beyond it for functional or helpful purposes, but more for emotional or friendship purposes. What are your thoughts? on how people will use it to create friendship, become friends with it. How long will that take or will it be normalized? I love that question from Freddie. It is a really, really good one. Um, There have been some really great articles looking at communities of people who use this app called Replica to create AI boyfriends or girlfriends. That's probably like one of the most common manifestations of people turning to AI for relationships. There's definitely upsides and downsides. The upside that I was really surprised in reading some of this reporting is that you might assume that people turning to AI would become more introverted and less social. But in many instances, in having a supportive dynamic with an AI It brings people out of their shell. It actually makes them go on more hikes. It makes them explore their neighborhoods more. Um, But then the downside is that you basically are outsourcing a really important relationship to a company. So I think we will start seeing this more and more. It will become more normal over time. But I would just encourage people who are thinking about incorporating this into their own lives, that they should be aware that they are giving up a lot of their data to a private company and they are sort of at the whims of the company for the nature of their relationship. All right, let's move on to a few questions about law and regulation. This first one comes from Zoe So, who's also from Chicago, Illinois. I wanted to ask what you think the legal space surrounding generative AI is going to look like. For example, will algorithms be subjected to the same copyright laws as humans when the algorithm is being trained on licensed content? Or will we need new copyright laws specifically for content that algorithms train on? This is such a hot topic and it's really unknown right now. There's actually cases moving through court right now with artists suing AI tool companies for using their copyrighted images to develop these tools. And there's also one with coders that are suing companies as well for developing code generation systems 
on their code. And the argument that the artists are making is that these images are copyrighted and the companies should not be allowed to just hoover up all of our copyrighted images and start generating things in the style of our art or derivative of the style of our art. And companies are arguing that this is like technology development and AI needs this kind of data. It should be fair use. Otherwise, if you just get rid of the ability of these tools to learn from all kind of copyright information, it would really hamper the development of these tools. So this is a really big debate and artists are definitely really heavily trying to push for algorithms essentially to be held to the same standard as humans, because if they are not, it could be devastating, they argue, to their livelihoods. And Karen, some listeners also wanted to know about the global regulatory landscape. Here's Artem Betkovsky from Westfield, New Jersey. If AI is regulated in the United States or Europe and not regulated in China, would it give an upper hand in AI competition to the authoritarian regimes? So what's really interesting is China is actually more heavily regulated than the U.S. when it comes to AI development. The U.S. has no federal law around AI. China has a few laws around this. One of the most recent ones is actually a law on quote unquote deep synthesis technologies, which is essentially China's term for generative AI. And it stipulates that any kind of tool that is a generative AI tool needs to make sure that it doesn't spew misinformation, that it's labeled if it could fool users into thinking that it's actually real output. There are definitely some issues around the way that that China has written the law. But in general, the premise that I think is sort of popularized in the West or in the U.S., especially by members of Congress, is that China has no regulation around these things. So the U.S. really shouldn't implement regulation to fall behind. But actually, China has been quite fast and quite aggressive in regulating some of these areas. And I'm curious, Karen, these regulations in China, they're fairly new, but do we have a sense of how well they're working? Because this is a difficult thing to try and come in and regulate. There are a lot of questions and there's a lot of skepticism around whether or not some of the regulations that China has written will actually be implementable or enforceable. And that is, we don't really know right now how it's going to play out because they are so new. They basically came into effect in just the last few months. But in terms of looking at a model for AI regulation, that seems really promising thus far. I think Europe is actually really stand out in the way that it is advancing these issues and thinking about how to write regulation that is more enforceable. So the EU right now has the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. And it's also in the process of drafting the AI Act that are all sort of interlocking laws that are trying to handle issues around data privacy, around platform uh, use of AI, around the amplification of misinformation on platforms, and around generative AI tools. All right, Karen, our last question is a little technical. My name is Danny Leal, and I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. And my question is, uh, since we have all this new technology, the AI technology, how is the possibility for that technology to be integrated to um, quantum computing? Is that a possibility? Okay, Karen, before you get into that answer, can you just start by reminding us what quantum computers are? So the way to think about a quantum computer is your laptop is what scientists would call a classical computer. So all of the information that is encoded in your laptop is encoded with bits, which are these like digital ones and zeros that are then representing things like numbers that then can help represent images, can represent text or anything that ends up showing up on your computer screen. But quantum computers, they represent information in a totally different way using what are known as quantum bits. And essentially quantum bits are trying to exploit the really weird physics that happens at microscopic levels, um, like at the particle level, where a particle can be a zero and a one at the same time. So the principle of a quantum computer is that if you can somehow successfully control these quantum bits and get them to organize themselves in a way that allows you to get them to compute information, then 
the computation would happen like super fast. The issue with quantum computers right now is that scientists haven't really figured out how to control quantum bits, <laughs> which means that they're not so useful when you're trying to compute anything. But the reason why quantum computers would become so powerful for artificial intelligence is because AI at its core is just a ton of math problems. Like the computer is crunching lots and lots of numbers, doing lots of math to try to find patterns in data. And if you could just have a far more powerful computational device that crunches numbers and does the math way faster than you could do problems that might take a classical computer thousands of years in a split second. Okay, we'll have to leave it there. Karen, thank you so much for joining us to answer these questions. Thank you so much, Zoe. And even though we couldn't get to all your questions, thank you to everyone who submitted one. For those of you wondering about what new generative AI technology means for the future of work, particularly creative fields like art, we're going to get into that next Monday. Until then, you can catch regular episodes of Tech News Briefing in this feed. And if you want even more tech news, check out our website, wsj.com. Today's show was produced by Julie Chang. We had production support from Madison Conti. Our supervising producer is Melanie Roy, and our executive producer is Chris Zinsley. This episode was mixed by Michael Laval, and I'm your host, Zoe Thomas. Thanks so much for listening.